From the California State Senate, this is Senate Spotlight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Senate Spotlight, where we discuss legislative priorities, policy, and other related issues with members of the California State Senate. From the state capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green, and joining us uh, this time around for our inaugural program for 2014 is uh, Senator Mark Leno of San Francisco. He's the chair of the uh, Senate Budget Committee. Welcome, happy new year to you. Thank you, Brian, it's great to be back in your spotlight. We're always glad to have you, and there's always something to talk about. And I know we're starting here the second year of a two-year session, and uh, new legislation coming out, uh, legislation left over from last year, getting another chance at life. And then, of course, we have uh, a 2014-2015 state budget, as by tradition, the governor has already introduced. Uh, and it sounds like it's actually kind of an extraordinary budget in the sense that there's really not a lot of bad choices this year in contrast to uh, previous years. We're actually seeing an improving economy, uh, the effect on the state's footprint much more positive. I assume that's what you're seeing and for your capacity as chair, right? It's quite honestly a remarkable turn of events given how dark and dreary our budget situation was just a few years ago when Jerry Brown was elected three years ago. He was looking at a $22 billion deficit approximately. Now we're looking at many multi-billion dollars of surpluses projected over the next four or five years. Not to depress a bright situation, but it is important, and this is why the governor's being so fiscally conservative in his budget proposal, that all of the surpluses, which come to seven, eight, nine billion in the next four years or so, is all projected on the economy continuing to expand. So historically, expansions last for about five years. So depending upon your own view of history, if the economy's bottom fell out in 2008 and the expansion began in 2009, you can subtract nine from mm -hmm. 14. Yes. yes, There could be, historically speaking, another recession a year or so in front of us. We hope that doesn't happen. We, this has been a very slow recovery. Maybe we're in a new period and it's not going to match historical patterns so that we could continue to see this kind of growth. Most of the additional revenue, the surplus money is coming from not corporate taxes, which unfortunately in recent years have continued to shrink. It wasn't too long ago when corporate tax revenues represented about 15% of our revenue pie. Now it's down to about 9%. That six billion dollars we're not getting from corporations, which means you and I and our my constituents are making up the difference mm -hmm. in personal income taxes. And a lot of that additional revenue is from capital gains. So of course the stock market has seen record gains and that's where a lot of the money is coming from. And yes, a very small percentage of taxpayers is making up a lot of our revenue. But that's you've got to go where the revenue is to be able to capture it in taxes. And given that some projections suggest that 95% of all of the economic gains in this recovery has gone to the top 1%. Well, then certainly it's going to be the top 1% that's going to make up most of our mm -hmm. tax revenue. Well, obviously those taxpayers in 2012 uh, voted to approve Proposition 30. Yes. So to that point, where does Prop 30 play into the fiscal health of the state as we speak here in 2014? So Prop 30, of course, raised personal income tax rates for those earning over $250,000 a year as an individual, $500,000 for a joint return. And then the other part of Prop 30 was a, unfortunately a regressive tax in mm -hmm. that it uh, increased our sales tax, which impacts those with the least the most. And both of these are temporary. They're going to be expiring about three, four years. But should the economy continue to expand, the taxes if things were to continue as they are, could sunset and we would still be balanced and potentially with additional surplus revenues. Well, you bring up a good point. In fact, the governor, when he introduced his budget, was asked this question, was Prop 30 <clears throat> even necessary? The state was already getting healthy by the end of 2012. Was that extra going to the voters to plea for more money for the taxes, was that even necessary at this point? Well, I was in session, so I didn't hear his response to that question. My response His response was yes. <laughs> mine would have been yes. a, a very heartfelt yes. Mm -hmm. And not to digress too much, but the need for the taxes was because Arnold Schwarzenegger cut taxes by about $6 billion annually 
by rescinding a restoration of the vehicle license fee. And that $6 billion hole never got refilled. And the Legislative Analyst Office, nonpartisan independent Legislative Analyst Office, tell, told us every year we cannot grow our way out of this hole. It's there. That was the structural imbalance of our budget. So Prop 30 didn't perfectly refill that hole that Schwarzenegger dug us into, but it did a good job of addressing the problem. And so I agree with the governor. Yes, Prop 30 was needed. And you then, you say, just not to rehash it, but you say you do agree with the governor's uh, balance of wanting a, a fiscal reserve and also to pay off the debt, because he says that he's trying to avoid the reckless spending binge, that's his quote, uh, and undo some of the, the damage that was done, as he put it, by previous governors. Uh, and uh, he's a fiscally conservative guy anyway. We saw that in his earlier terms back in sure. the 70s. Uh, are you as uh, Democrats going to find that a little bit difficult in looking at some of the other issues, uh, the restoration of, so, of a real frayed social social system here in California and the restoration of funding, is that going to be something that's going to be a challenge for you and your fellow Democrats coming to the governor in this budget year to ask for backfill of some of these things, more money? Let me say on the record, I agree with the governor to a degree. So we Senate Democrats have been saying for the past year that let's consider taking every surplus dollar that we have and dividing it into thirds, what could be more balanced. A third of the dollar would go to reserves, rainy day fund. A third would go to repayment of debt. But a third would be to reinvest in California. And that would be the restoration, not necessarily creating new programs. This is not about new spending. It's beginning to incrementally reinvest in so many of the programs that we have cut. And I still think a third, a third, a third is arguably very balanced approach. The need is great out there. There are those who would say, how can you put money into a rainy day fund? Excuse the analogy in the middle of a drought. But it is <laughs> pouring out there. People are suffering, suffering horribly. I'll give you just one example. There are dozens, thinking of a couple right now. But for example, we have courtrooms that are closing. We have mm -hmm. courthouses that are closing. There'll be more closures in our court system. That means lack of access to justice. That's a fundamental building block of our democracy when Californians have to drive four hours across their county to get to a courtroom and then have to wait five hours to wait in line to contest a parking ticket. I mean, that's a small example, but we're talking about restraining orders or people who are trying to get a divorce or all sorts of things that, you know, you only need the court system and the judicial system when times are bad, when everything's going fine in your life, you don't need it. But when you've got a problem, that's when you need the system. And the system is very crippled right now. Governors put about $105 million in the budget for the judiciary above where we were last year. That's certainly a good start. We're hearing that it's probably closer to around $260 million needed just to tread water, just to keep up with the bad state of affairs we find ourselves currently. There have been some news reports in recent months that residential care facilities for the elderly, these are Homes, single family homes that have up to about six frail elderly, sometimes disabled people in them. They are assisted living. They don't need a lot of medical care, but they need assisted living. Mm -hmm. And because we have so underfunded the community care licensing division of the Department of Social Services, which oversees these homes, that there has been serious neglect and abuse, and people are dying in these facilities. We used to have inspections, unannounced inspections in these facilities once every year. Now the law says once every five years, and we haven't even been able to do that because we have so underfunded that department. So there's a need to reinvest. And of course, these are dollars that will be spent in our community, so they'll create jobs, and they'll benefit the economy as well. So it's good for the economy for there to be some spending. Now, I'm not suggesting no, we don't need to put money aside and we don't need to pay down our debt. No, we need to do all those things. Well, that must be frustrating for you as a lawmaker uh, for these very compelling arguments about spending here on the budget. You still get the pushback from folks out there. Well, whenever there's surplus, whenever there's extra money, the politicians want to spend it. Right. So it's, does that get frustrating for you to hear that when you make these compelling arguments? It's a fact of life. It's my job then to make sure that I respond as clearly as possible. This is not profligate spending. We're not suggesting creating any new programs. 
We're just saying in a very incremental fashion over the next three, four, five, ten years, we've got to rebuild the public infrastructure that we had to dismantle as a result of the $40 billion of general fund money we lost when Arnold Schwarzenegger cut taxes and put it on our credit card and we're paying interest on that debt to this day and the economic downturn the entire planet experienced in 2008. So it's going to take a while, but we can't turn our back to the fact that there are services that taxpayers expect. If you've got an aged family member and you can't keep them in your home anymore and they need to go to a residential care facility, you'd like to believe that someone is overseeing it to make sure mm -hmm. that grandma's leg is not going to get broken and she's sitting in a bed unattended and in fact may die. And I'm not making this up. This happened recently in San Diego. 27 people died in San Diego. So there's a lot, a lot to reinvest in. Uh, I could give you many more examples. But to get back to that third, third, third of reserve, repay, reinvest, the governor's proposal of r reserve money, repayment of debt is 90%, and he's only got 10% for reinvestment. So I would suggest that's the playing field on which we're going to have our debate in the coming year. No, the governor's presented a very strong, thoughtful budget, and he's put a little bit everywhere, so you can't really say he overlooked anything. The question is, is there enough there for reinvestment? And again, that, that's where our debate will be this year. Well, the biggest beneficiaries uh, for this year's budget for the first time, thanks to the improving economy and the, the buffer of Prop 30, are the schools. Oh, Billions of, of dollars more going to the schools and community colleges. So that's good news. And thank you for pointing that out, because all of this reinvestment that I'm talking about is with non-educational dollars. Of course, Prop 98 requires that a percentage of all new money year to year goes directly to K through 14 including our community colleges education. So that's great. And in fact, over a three year period, we're gonna see about 22 billion more dollars spent on K through 12. So from our darkest days, we were spending of general fund money, about $7,000 per pupil. We're gonna be over 9,000 in the governor's proposal. And that's great because the need is, is significant. We're still ranking in the very bottom of states in per pupil spending. New York State, I'm telling you we're at about 9,000 of general fund spending. Mm -hmm. It's closer to 15,000. And I recently learned New York City augments what the state of New York does, $25,000 per pupil in the New York City public school system. How can we compete? How can our kids compete? Right. It's, it's really unfortunate. So yes, education is going to benefit more than any other area of state expenditures. And there's also money for higher education. Our California State University system, our University of California system will get an extra 145 mil million approximately, which will make sure that there will be no tuition increases in the coming year. I know you and your uh, Democratic colleagues and the leadership of the legislature last uh, last year during the, the uh, twilight of the, the budget process kind of drew a line in the sand that there were certain things that you wanted, uh, funds uh, for uh, for social services, funds for mental health, uh, augmenting that program uh, for the prisons as well. You got that. This year there's a few things that have been asked for, including transitional kindergarten. I know that's uh, the pro, one of the pro temps priorities. Not in the budget, but I guess there's still time for some wiggle room between you and the governor, right? Certainly, it's a process. It's a process. The governor introduces his new budget the first week of the new year. We have to pass a budget by June 15th. We will. We have for the past three years, on time, balanced. It will happen again. And that's because voters now allow the majority party, the majority of the legislature, whether they're one party or the other, but for a majority of the body to be able to do its work. And that's what democracy is all about, majority rules, not two-thirds majority, but simple majority rules. And so we will be uh, with an on-time budget again. The transitional kindergarten, which the Senate president pro tem is advocating for, because every study shows that to the degree that we can get four-year-olds into education before they get to kindergarten, will spell much greater success. Their reading scores will be much better by the third grade. And it's really a concept of investing early rather than later because by making these kinds of investments, high school uh, graduation rates rise significantly as well. And given that 75% of our prison inmates are without high school diplomas, we can 
keep our community safer and make sure that people have a greater opportunity to succeed in life if we invest early in early education. That has a price tag to it, but those dollars could come out of the Prop 98, the education side of our budget, as opposed to the non-98, the non-education side of our budget that we were talking about earlier. Well, as uh, we say here at the beginning of the year, all things legislatively and budget-wise, still the opening act, still the uh, still everything as proposals. We'll see what happens this right. year. So we'll have budget review hearings at the full budget committee through the next weeks of January and early February. Then the budget subcommittees by issue area will be reviewing line item by line item the entire budget. And once that work is done, the full budget committee will convene again by mid-May and then joining through a conference committee process with the assembly so we can agree upon a budget by June 15th. Well, we will have you back again to talk about that and some of your other legislative, your own personal legislative agenda for this year. But we're out of time. Thank you again for coming in. It's great to see you uh, to kick off the year. So we'll, we'll have you back again. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right. State Senator Mark Leno uh, from uh, San Francisco, the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. And that is it for this edition of Senate Spotlight. Please join us next time around as we discuss legislative issues and policies with the newsmakers and newsbreakers of the California State Senate. From the State Capitol in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Senate Spotlight.